The Fermi Paradox Part 16 Bellerophon The discovery of the first planet around another star like our own was not a fortuitous accident. It was, in fact, a simple application of the most basic of Newtonian laws. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Just as the gravity of stars pulls on planets, so planets also pull on their stars, only, because planets are infinitesimally small compared to their stars, their respective tugs are equally minute. Nonetheless, they are observable as very slight wobbles in the star's motion relative to Earth. Such a wobble was used to detect Sirius B, the companion to the nearby star Sirius as far back as 1844. But Sirius B is a white dwarf, a dense, hot, stellar corpse with a mass nearly equal to our sun. And the wobble it produced still only amounted to a few arc seconds, that is to say, one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. To detect a planet the size of Jupiter, you would need precision of less than a milliarc second, or several thousand times greater. By the 1980s, astronomers believed their detectors were sensitive enough to attempt the search. Several were undertaken. None were successful. By 1995, teams of astronomers were engaging in a race to find the first extrasolar planet around a sun-like star. Chief among them, Swiss astronomer Michel Mayor. Over the course of his career, Mayor had developed remarkably precise techniques to measure the Doppler shifts of stars. We usually associate the Doppler shift with sound. It is most commonly encountered when a police siren gradually deepens in tone as it speeds down the street. As the police car passes us, the waves of sound it produces are lengthened by its movement away from our ear. But the Doppler shift also occurs with light. As an object moves towards us, the light waves it emits contract, shifting them toward the bluer end of the spectrum. As it moves away, the light waves lengthen, shifting it towards the redder end. This red shift and blue shift is usually used to measure the distance and speed of receding galaxies. But Mayor had refined his technique to the point where it could detect the minuscule redshift a star made as it wobbled in response to an unseen companion. Unlike previous techniques, Mayor's did not rely on distance. The shift in the spectrum could be seen no matter how far away the star was from Earth. Before then, he had successfully located high-mass dim companions around stars, so-called brown dwarfs but nothing as small as a planet. In 1994, he and graduate student Diede Kelos took aim at 147 sun-like stars and set about changing that. Despite his method's proven usefulness, and despite his certainty of success, when Mayor saw the first evidence that he had found an extrasolar planet, he didn't believe it. He assumed there had to be a problem with his equipment, and spent several months testing alternate hypothesis after alternate hypothesis to breaking point. He didn't believe what he had found, because what he had found was beyond even the imaginations of the most outlandish science fiction writers. Upon turning his gaze to 51 Pegasi, an unremarkable star similar to our sun, he found that the size of its wobble suggested it was being tugged by a planet about the size of Saturn. That he had expected. What he had not expected was that the planet was orbiting the star once every four days. Nothing like this had even been conceived of before. To orbit its star in just four days, the planet would have to be at an eighth Mercury's distance from its sun. Mercury, mind you, is a blasted, irradiated fossil world. But this was no Mercury. It was the size of Saturn, and presumably a gas giant. Every model of planetary formation said that gas giants formed at the outer reaches of their system, where building materials were plentiful, allowing them to reach their gigantic sizes. How had one found itself so close to its sun that it must have been subjected to temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius? The first thing Mayor had to do was confirm his discovery, and to do so, he contacted Geoffrey Marcy, his main competitor in the race to locate the first extrasolar planet. Naturally, Marcy was skeptical, even cynical, but he agreed to rerun Mayor's observations on 51 Pegasi and, to his immense surprise, confirmed his result. This truly alien, hellish planet was real. Mayor and Marcy would go on to discover over 70 planets, many of which 
were of this bizarre new form dubbed hot Jupiters. But how could these freakish planets even exist? Over time, a model emerged in which planets are not the stable pieces of celestial clockwork we see them as, but often migrate inward and outward before settling into their stable configurations. Such a migration is even believed to have occurred in our own solar system, as Uranus and Neptune switched places, and Neptune was flung into the proto-Kuiper belt. A hot Jupiter must have formed at a distance where gas giants were possible, and then over time spiraled toward its star until it was locked in its current close embrace. Because it had been found in the constellation Pegasus, Geoffrey Marcy nicknamed 51 Pegasi B Bellerophon, after the ancient Greek hero who had ridden the Pegasus and slain the Chimaira, but who had decided, in his hubris, to ride the horse to heaven, and been shot out of the air by Zeus. An appropriate name, perhaps, for a planet torn from its heavenly position and sent spiraling into hell. That said, the International Astronomical Union isn't always so mythically minded, and when, in 2014, they granted certain extrasolar planets the right to have proper names, they decided to name the planet Dimidium after the Latin word for half. The discovery of hot Jupiters was initially a boon to the rare Earth argument. After all, how could a terrestrial planet survive the stampeding migration of a gas giant planet, scattering all in its way like so many pinballs? Well, computer simulations have shown this need not necessarily happen. The planet-forming rubble may simply be moved into other orbits, rather than scattered completely out of the system. Once the system is stabilized, terrestrial planets may still form. But however forgiving of Earth-like planets hot Jupiters may be, they were never going to point us in the direction of extraterrestrial intelligence. To find another Earth, we need another method. And we will be discussing that method in the next episode.